you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. Be with us as we seek your guidance in this hour. Amen. Good morning. Howard, was that your grandchildren? They are my great-grandchildren. <laughs> Just saying. They did great, didn't they? I want to read a couple of verses of Scripture from the book of Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 25 through 37. <clears throat> On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled along where, where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. When he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return... I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. May the Lord bless those words for this morning. Let me ask you a question. What is something that is essential for human life, is highly contagious, and must be taken, must not be taken for granted? Any ideas on that? Huh? Love, love. It's kindness. Love's quote, kindness. You might think that's crazy to say that it's essential for human life and highly contagious, but I think I can back that up a little bit. <clears throat> there was a student asked Mary Mar Margaret Mead, who was an anthropologist back in the 60s, what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a society. In other words, what separates an uncivilized collection of people from a true civilization? Now, she could have mentioned the first signs of tools, or like grinding stones or clay pots that they could carry water and food in. Or she could have mentioned art, like cave paintings and uh, uh, carved statues. Instead, she said the first sign of civilization, in her opinion, was when an ancient skeleton was found with a healed thigh bone. Why was that a sign of civilization? It was Meade's estima uh, estimation that in a competitive, primitive culture where people had to hunt and they had to escape predators in order to survive each day, the fact that someone set aside their own work in order to care for another person's injury was a sign of civilization. And she went on to say, a broken femur that is healed is evidence that someone has taken time to stay with that person that was hurt, bandaged up the wound, carried the person to safety, and tended to the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. 
That's a great thought as we get into this story that we read this morning. Jesus is one of his most, if not the most famous story in the Bible, the story of the Good Samaritan. Last year, researchers from the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom did a study on the topic of kindness. They studied kindness. They published an online questionnaire and called the, the kindness test and asked people to uh, respond all over the world and share their attitudes and experiences on the topic of kindness. The research showed that when we experience and witness acts of kindness, we are much more likely to offer kindness to other people. We see it, we want to do it. This is a contagious aspect of kindness. And when we perform an act of kindness, the reward signs or reward system in our brains lights up and gives us pleasure. We feel good, which causes us to look for more opportunities to do kind things. But kindness can cost us. It can cost us. And that's a good point to consider as we look at this story of the Good Samaritan. <clears throat> now the story begins, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up at, to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Have you ever noticed how many times in the Bible Jesus answers a question with a question? There's a book titled Jesus is the Question, and it states that in the Gospels, Jesus asks more questions than he answers. To be precise, Jesus asks 307 questions in the Gospels. He is asked only 183 questions, of which he only answers three directly. He only answered three questions directly. Now Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. He had all the answers in life, yet he asked far more questions than he answered. Why do you suppose that was? Maybe because an answer provides certainty. Two plus two is four. That's certain. It's no other answer. It's four. But a question promotes growth. You have to think about it. Which one was more important to Jesus? I think we know the answer. You see, something we get, sometimes we get frustrated or disillusioned when we read the Bible or when we pray or when we come to church and we're not finding the answers to our questions. We do all these things and we still have questions. Our questions aren't answered. We feel like failures. I mean, what am I doing wrong, Lord? What am I doing wrong? I, I don't get the answer. But notice how often Jesus, who could have easily, easily given us all the answers, asks questions instead. Wrestling with your questions does not make you a spiritual failure. You got questions, you're not a failure. It may be God's greatest tool for forming you into the man or woman that God wants you to be. So let's get back to this expert in the law. He asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus in turn asked him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Now the expert in the law answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. So the expert in the law asked a question, and he got an answer. Jesus answered his question, but that's not the end of the conversation. Maybe this expert in the law wanted to expose Jesus, and this has always been my contention. He wanted to show him up. 
He was a learned man. He was a lawyer. And he's going to show up this country preacher. But maybe he, this question exposed his own deepest need. Because you see, a person can have all the right answers, have them all, about God and still not know God. So the question this Bible story raises is, would you rather be right or would you rather be right with God? Now this is a common expression, but it's not a question we ask ourselves enough. Would you rather have all the answers or would you rather have a relationship with a loving God, even if that relationship doesn't have all the answers to your questions. The expert in the law may have been right. He answered the question right, but I think he knew that he wasn't right with God. The next verse reads, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I'll get him yet. Who is my neighbor? He wanted to prove himself. He wanted to prove himself smarter than this country preacher. Some neuroscientists at the uh, Paris Brain Institute conducted a fascinating study in which they hooked up volunteers to an electrocardiogram. And they measured their heartbeats as they listened to a story being read aloud. And they found that as they listened to the story, their heartbeats synchronized with one another. Even when the volunteers were physically in separate places, their heartbeats eventually synced up with the heartbeats of those other ones that were listening to the same story. And I mention this because Jesus is about to answer this man's question with a story. One of the most famous stories in the Bible, if not the most famous story. The expert in the law set out to test Jesus. That was his whole purpose, to test Jesus. But with this story, Jesus is testing him and us. With this story, Jesus is trying to synchronize our heartbeats with the heart of God. Trying to get us in sync with God. Why? Why does he want to do that? Because the more you love God, the more your life will be in sync with God's heart. And what does it mean to look like to love God with everything you have and to love your neighbor as yourself? What's that look like? Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. There was this woman in New York City who lived there, and she was discussing her neighborhood. Now, in New York City, in Manhattan, uh, people that live there separate Manhattan. Depends on what side of Houston Street you live on. Houston Street runs up through Manhattan. If you live on the south side of Houston Street, you live in Soho. If you live on the north side of Houston Street, you live in NoHo. But this woman lived in a very troublesome neighborhood. Somewhere in between those two, and she called it, uh-oh. Jesus' listeners would have understood that road between Jerusalem and Jericho was an uh-oh kind of neighborhood. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho stretches about 18 miles through desert terrain. It's hot. It's dry. It's rocky. It's rough. And in Jesus' day, it was a place where common thieves and robbers would hide in the rocks and jump travelers and rob them and beat them and kill them. 
this guy was caught in a bad neighborhood. And most of us use this information to justify what happened to him. Well, he shouldn't have been there by himself. You know, he, he shouldn't have gone that time of day. He knows better that maybe he should have had a, a concealed weapon. But Jesus continues. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now let me make this point. The priest and the Levite were going away from Jerusalem. They were going the same way that the guy that got mugged was going. All three of them were going away from Jerusalem. They had been in Jerusalem, and now they were leaving Jerusalem and going down the Jericho Road, in all probability to Jericho. Now, this implies that they had just left from serving their religious duties in the temple. Priests and Levites were always going into Jerusalem to serve their religious duties. Had this guy been, these priests and Levites been going to Jerusalem and they saw this guy and somebody questioned him, well, why didn't you help that guy? He was hurt. They would say, well, I got duties in Jerusalem. I mean, I got, I got to be there on time. I, I can't be late for church. But you see, they had no excuse, none whatsoever. They represented the first half of Jesus' teaching. And that was, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. They upheld that, but they failed to this, do the second. And their failure demonstrates their ignorance of the heart of God. Their hearts were out of sync with the eye heart of God. And if they loved God more, they would have loved the injured man the way God did. But they didn't. Jesus finishes this story. <clears throat> he said, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now considering how Jews in Jesus' day had such contempt for the Samaritans, this sense of compassion on the part of this Samaritan man seems extraordinary. He went to him and bandaged up his wounds. He poured expensive wine and oil on his wounds as a healant. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he walked to an inn. And he stayed with him. He took care of him through the rest of the day. And all that night, the next day, he took out two denarii or two silver coins and told the innkeeper, look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, I assumed that this guy was kind of like a traveling salesman, and he'd been up and down this road a lot, and he probably had stopped at that inn more than once or twice, so he knew the innkeeper and the innkeeper was, knew that he was good for his money. And here's to, I'll do that. I'll see you on your return trip. But then Jesus asked the expert in the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Rear Admiral Thornton Miller was a chaplain during the Second World War. He had just given a speech at Johnson Bible College and was having a question and answer time afterward. And one of the students asked him, uh, they were all asking him about wanting to know what it was like in the, the war, the Second World War, and especially uh, um, D-Day at Normandy. He was on the beach that day. And Admiral Miller described the firefight that day, the, the vivid, the, 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 the terrible things that happened. And he was very vivid in his terms. 
And as a military chaplain, he had gone up and down that beach, dodging bombs, and dodging gunfire, doing anything he could to help those, praying with them, aiding them any way he could. Well, a student asked him, well, why did you risk your own life on the beach that day? And he said, because I'm a minister. And so this kid wanted to reword his question, and he said, but I did, but didn't you ask them whether they was Catholic or, or Protestant or, or, or Jewish or maybe even an atheist? I, I mean, if you're a minister and he's stumbling around and Admiral Miller interrupted him and he said, if you're a minister, the only question you ask is, can I help you? Got that? If you're a minister, the only question you ask is, can I help you? You see, the priest and the Levite and the expert in the law, they all failed to ask the important question. Can I help you? And this failure reveals their lack of love for God. Because Jesus makes it very clear in this Bible story and in our own life that the heart of God is a heart of mercy. There's mercy. Jesus doesn't commend anyone for their religious credentials or their knowledge of the law. He commends one who puts love for a stranger into action. He commends the one who risks himself on behalf of the enemy. That's what he does. What does John 3, 16 and 17, what is considered the most central verses of the Bible, the New Testament, what do, what do they say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What was Jesus' final question in this Bible story today? Well, it says, and then Jesus asked the expert in the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, when you stand before God someday, and you all will, and so will I, will stand there in front of that white throne. And God wants to, I want to know whether God cares more about your correct theology, or does he care about your acts of mercy? Look at the life of Jesus and decide which one is more in sync with God's heart. Then, Go and do likewise. Amen? Amen. There is that place of quiet rest. It's near to the heart of God. We all want to be there. But there's things we have to do before we get there. We have to be kind to one another. We have to lend a helping hand. We have to reach out to that person that is in need. We may not know him. We may not really like him, but we need to reach out. He's hurting, and we need to reach out to him in the heart of God. Until we meet again, amen.